Welcome back. I think we'll try to get started. Um, what I'll do is I will introduce um, the, the three speakers that we'll hear from now um, at one point, one time, and then, then we'll proceed to their talks. And then I hope to have a question and answer period with all of the speakers um, from this morning. Um, the first presentation in this part of the program will be given by Jason Allred. Um, he is an associate professor in the Department of Architecture at Iowa State and also um, principal at Substance Architecture in Des Moines. He is the author of two books, one co-authored with Thomas Leslie entitled Design Tech, an Integrated Approach to Building Science and Technology, as well as the catalog for the exhibition The Century of Iowa Architecture that some of you might remember from a couple of years ago. Um, he's published articles, book chapters, and reviews, including an analysis of the three phases of construction at the Des Moines Art Center. Um, he is an award-winning architect, uh, including the restoration of Drake's Orion E. Scott Memorial Chapel, for which he served as the principal in charge and project manager. And he draws on that expertise in speaking today in a talk that's entitled Iowa Modern, the Orion E. Scott Chapel and the Development of Modern Architecture in Iowa. Um, we will then hear from Jennifer Ersfeld James, um, a freelance writer, editor, and consultant, who is also an expert in historic preservation. Her research specialization is in the revitalize, revitalization of neighborhoods in which communities partner with urban universities. And as a partner in the James Development Group, she has won awards for excellence for the restoration of the University Lofts Building, um, as well as 10 houses. She's also written successful nominations for National Register of Historic Places. Um, she, for those of you who are familiar with the area, you also know her as the owner of Mars Cafe, a popular neighborhood gathering place. Um, Jennifer's also a resident of the Drake neighborhood. And fittingly, she will be speaking on the relationship between the neighborhood and the campus in a talk entitled Housing the Drake Student Body, a Historical Overview. And we will hear then from Dan Sloan, um, who actually received his BFA from Drake, so he has a long affiliation with the institution. He's a principal at Baldwin White Architects in Des Moines, um, has had an active role on many advisory boards for the city of Des Moines related to architecture and urban design. He specializes in the renovation of late 19th and early 20th century buildings and has won awards for his renovations, including the Boyd Cottage in Des Moines, as well as the downtown school for the Des Moines public schools system. He's worked for no numerous colleges and universities, including Grinnell College, Iowa State University, and the University of Iowa. Um, and uh, again, specifically relevant to this morning's program, he has been very active on the Drake campus in recent years. Um, being uh, in charge of the renovation of the quad dormitories and developing plans for the interior renovations of Harvey Ingham Hall and um, proposed renovations for Hubble Dining Hall. And he will be speaking about one of those projects um, in a talk that's titled The Quad Residence Hall's Renovation, Thinking, Rethinking Saarinen Inside Out. So um, please help me in welcoming Jason Allred. Thanks very much, Mark. Let's see if I can get this set up correctly. Is that working? Everyone hear me? Very good. I got a heads up from the back. Um, the, let's see if I can get this to open up. The, a couple of events, um, a couple of things uh, have happened uh, to me that um, are the reasons why I'm here uh, giving this presentation uh, today. One is that uh, in 2004, the American Institute of Architects in Iowa celebrated the 100 years of uh, the AIA in Iowa, and I was fortunate to be the chair of the um, uh, Buildings of the Century program, which was uh, a nomination process to try to have a jury to put together a publication on what the uh, significant buildings were in Iowa of the century. So we did a, a series of nominations, and we had a jury, and we put, we put that together. Um, and, uh, and so the, part of the, the show today is I'll talk a little bit about what the projects were and, and what we learned uh, some from that process of looking at the development of architecture in the 20th century in Iowa. Um, the other part of this, though, is that um, uh, 
after that was done, C.Y. Stevens was selected by the jury as the, the most significant building of the century in Iowa. Uh, and my partner at the office, Paul Mankins, uh, had received a call from David Croydonier, um, who people may be familiar with, a sort of patron of architecture in, in Des Moines and, and heavily involved in the Art Center as well. And, and he had asked Paul to come meet with him, and Paul didn't know why. Um, and he'd asked Paul what he thought about the program. And Paul said, well, you know, he thought it was an interesting program. And he said, well, what do you think C.Y. Stevens is that is that the most significant building in Iowa? And Paul said, you know, I understand why that selection would be made, but that from Paul's personal opinion, that was not the most, the most significant building in Iowa, that he thought that the Scott Chapel on the Drake campus was the finest, most significant building in Iowa. And at that point, David Croydonier, who was, who was quite uh, old at the time, banged his fist on the desk and said, exactly, you know, that's right. That is the finest building in Iowa. Um, and so, Paul very fortunately uh, selected correctly uh, at, at that moment, um, and had uh, uh, David at that point had committed to um, uh, funding the restoration of the chapel because the chapel was in some bad repair at that time. So uh, I was I then became the the project architect really on that job to to try to piece the chapel back back together and, and do a bit of a restoration project on that. So I'm, I, I, because of the buildings of the century is how I ended up eventually working on the, the chapel project here. So, um, so basically, uh, I was just gonna show a little bit of what the, the projects were. We'll, we'll check our time here. Um, the way the, the way the jury for the buildings of the century worked out is it was by decade and, and the, the jury had made some selections. So, um, a couple of things I'd just like to take note of, these are some of the images from this, is Proudfoot and Bird, which eventually became Brooksburg Skiles, uh, the firm that was involved with Saarinen's on this. It was a very important firm in, in Des Moines um, and in Iowa, and this is one of their, their finest buildings of the, the sort of neoclassical style, which is in Des Moines. This one, this one sits opposite of the state capitol. Court Avenue went towards this building as the terminus of, this, of the of, uh, government here. Uh, and then uh, Grand Avenue, Locust Street goes towards the Capitol on the other way. So the city is organized on these two axes that go towards local and, and, and state. Um, and this is a really very nice example of this building. This is what we did at the beginning of the, of the century uh, to sort of establish what the, the kind of predominant styles were. Uh, but then we have this building done in 1909, uh, the City National Bank and Park Inn, where Frank Lloyd Wright, this is the, the last, as far as I understand, this is the, the last remaining hotel uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Hotel in the world, uh, the others being taken down. Uh, this is uh, one of the things significant about this project I, I find kind of funny when I look at the images of it, that um, you know, this kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, approach, this prairie style approach to uh, this is, is what you would see from this in 1909 on most of the buildings out at Jordan Creek Mall 100 years later, um, use exactly the same style that we would have developed at this period of time. Um, one of the things you find out through the course of this is that development in Iowa didn't come from east to west in a, per, in a sort of straight line like you might think. Um, certain cities get pockets of, of money and influence, and Mason City is one of these places which had a tremendous influence uh, on the development of architecture in Iowa and some of the projects that happened later um, in the century there. Uh, the, the, oh, okay, well, I don't have a slide. <laughs> All right, this is one of my places where I don't have some slides, um, which look like they showed up earlier. So uh, there's Rock Crest Rock Glen, which is the community that was developed there. I had a great drawing by Marion Mahoney Griffin of this. Um, and uh, uh, there's a few different houses, the Blythe House, uh, which is there. There's a number of houses. Um, and the Melson House, which is maybe the more uh, uh, significant one. This one was actually selected by the jury um, as one of the buildings of the, of the century in Iowa. Um, the, what happened was Walter Burley Griffin, I think this is outside of Oak Park, the largest collection of prairie style homes in the country as well. Um, and it's really, it's incredible to go and visit and see the different houses that are there. Shortly after this, Walter Burley Griffin won the competition for Canberra, uh, Australia, and went on to move to Australia and design the capital of Australia, which is sort of an interesting shift that, uh, that occurs. Uh, but when you go up there and you walk around, you kind of get the sense of this designed as a place. The Stockman residence is also up there, which has been relocated. But it's a kind of incredible uh, way to look at Mason City and think of, of the, the force of will that was there to put these projects together at that particular time. Um, and we also have uh, Louis Sullivan. This is one of the many um, 
uh, jewel box banks. Uh, you know, this is a project that every architecture student studies. Um, you know, I looked at it when I was at the University of Florida. I didn't know anything about it, um, but uh, but then you show up and it's and it's here. It's kind of amazing. Uh, it's kind of you know uh, Sullivan at the time. Uh, didn't have a lot of big projects necessarily, uh, but the, the lavish detail, the sort of exquisite way that you draw attention to the sum elements of the project, which uh, the terracotta kind of draws your attention just to the entrance, the rest is left really spare. There's, there's really good moments here of how you would uh, sort of choreograph and navigate your way through understanding how the building touches the sky, where the entrance is, um, and then understated details in the other parts of it. So, uh, and there's a number of those. Um, Sioux City is the other city that you see that is kind of amazing in the collection of architecture it has of a certain period of time. Um, uh, William Steele had won this uh, courthouse competition uh, with a neo-Gothic plan and then hired Purcell and Elmsey out of, uh, I think, Minneapolis to, to come in and do uh, the ornamentation design. What they came back with was a design of the whole building. Um, and design of the whole building in prairie style. Um, and so in Midwestern prairie style ar architecture, this is the largest example of a building of this type. Um, and this is really kind of significant because it's a scale jump, right? Prairie style is developed as a residential style in a lot of buildings and some jump of scale, but this is a huge jump of scale to take that style into a very large public building. Um, and it's exquisitely put together. Uh, the one failing of the building potentially is they have this plinth base, the horizontal plinth base, and the tower probably is too short for what you really would have wanted, right? I mean, if they'd had the ability to make that tower taller, it would balance the composition a bit better. Uh, and, and there are some drawings that suggest that that would have been the intention. Um, but as it, as it goes, this is really an exquisite example of, of these kinds of buildings over in Sioux City. Um, what we see in the 20s here is the, a, a push, and there's a number of these buildings, I show this one, the number of these buildings where you know, we're building things out of steel, and so the expression changes. Um, and how you build a tall building is a really difficult problem because you can't use the sort of Vitruvian rules of proportion very well. Um, and, uh, and, and Proudfoot, Bird, and Rawson, which again, uh, is the firm that does Brooks, Borg, and Skiles, does the equitable building, the tallest building in Iowa for a long period of time. Uh, as a steel frame and is expressive of that steel frame. This has these neo-Gothic uh, 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 sort of stylistic uh, ornamentation on it and this uh, great terracotta lantern on top, which is what in fact housed the water tower, which made the building fireproof, which was the problem of tall buildings at the time. If I'm way up there and it burns, I've got a serious problem. So having the water tower on the roof pressurizes that to be able to make the, get the water pressure in the building and to have the building be fireproof at that time. So. Uh, the Weeks family is here in Des Moines as well, the cosmetics family, uh, and they do this project, uh, which the jury selected as the building of this particular decade, um, uh, which I think it's a very significant building, but it's certainly not, repre it's representative of the time being the kind of 20s um, and, and selecting a style to, to essentially represent your status in the community. And it's a fantastic project. Um, uh, based on the King's Cottage, it has pieces of, in Salisbury, it has actual pieces of the buildings brought over. The truss work in the main hall is a 16th century building truss work that was brought from England and erected in the building as part of the structure of the building. So when you go, you're actually seeing new things and old things merge together to, to make the building. It has this flint uh, and stone exterior on the building. Um, but it's sited not like a European building, um, it's sited uh, where there's a, a drive up court on one side and then the gardens on the south side and it has an extensive garden which it, which it leads out into. Um, but certainly kind of a, a style looking backwards to what we would select in terms of representing uh, what our status is. Um, and the, the weeks, you know, this was a very expensive project uh, and of course very shortly after this bad things happened. Um, and so uh, the affording the project became a kind of a difficult, a difficult problem. Um, <laughs> So uh, it's, uh, but it's one of these things that you, it was the, it was uh, an education office building for a long time. I, I worked a little bit on the National Historic Register um, uh, when, when the building was being restored on, on doing some documentation there. And the offices were really in bad shape up there, but the main spaces are really nice and kind of a pleasure to go visit in this particular project. So, um, in the, in the 30s, uh, Sioux City again has this Badgero building. This is where we have Art Deco. Um, 
and the influence of that with the steel building. Uh, you know, one of the issues with a lot of these projects is that um, how do we determine an ornamental style when we no longer cling to a, to a neoclassical style? And what do you select when, you're, when you want to do ornamentation, uh, but you don't want to do ornamentation which references a sort of uh, a classical style? So uh, at the Badgero building uh, uh, in Sioux City, they essentially use this, uh, their heritage, their Native American heritage, and use these symbols as what they select as the ornamentation style. So it has the Art Deco kind of uh, geometric uh, machine-like um, moves, and then these ornament uh, that are picked from what they viewed as their heritage that they wanted to represent moving forward, um, which is kind of uh, you know indicative of this time when we're um, uh, we're looking at kind of. Uh, what is the appropriate style that we would build in to represent buildings of the of of that time or where we're headed towards the future? And this art modern, there's a number of these um, band shells. There's one in Fort Dodge. There's a number of them around. This is one of the the most nicely preserved ones um, of this modern streamlined style. And I think uh, uh, you mentioned this before about this representing a kind of technology about you know, what buildings should look like when they're related to the kinds of technology that's moving forward and what should the expression be of buildings at that time. Um, so you also have projects like this, uh, Alfred Caldwell doing the, uh, the city and the garden, uh, Eagle Point State Park. Uh, if you haven't visited this, it's pretty incredible to see. The collection of buildings and the landscape design, which are integrated together there, um, you know, clearly this is, uh, uh, you know, has a lot of relationship to arts and crafts, um, but it has this sort of fantastic way that the stonework on the ground links directly into the stonework that stacks up on the base, which then has the wooden bridge that spans over the base stonework, and then, uh, you know, the, the sort of column in the center of the stone anchoring it to the ground. Uh, with the piece on top. So it really seems to kind of grow out of the ground and then extend out over the landscape. And there's a number of projects here like this which are really quite, quite incredible. Uh, and, and one of the sort of early examples of linking landscape design to the building design in that style. Uh, and then the Butler Mansion, which was at one time called the most modern house in the country, uh, an art modern streamlined building. Uh, this had a lot of technological uh, uh, advances at the time. I think this was the first garage door opener, um, automatic garage door opener, which worked on some kind of light system, which I still don't completely understand. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, very much the kind of very smooth surfaces, immaterial in a way, right? You don't know what, you know it's, 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 a, it's a, a cement plaster, but it's, it doesn't show its materiality. It sits on the ground in a different way than a building that would have been stacked up. It kind of looks like it's landed there. Um, and, uh, and it has that kind of relationship. It, it, it blends in with its site at the edges pretty nicely, but it has a sort of um, odd material relationship as it moves up. And there's a bunch of these, these uh, buildings around in smaller houses. Uh, um, what happens when the war comes is that we have um, not many buildings being built. So there's a gap that occurs, of course. Um, this is one of the few of, uh, buildings being built at that time were public buildings. So. Uh, Hullabird and Root comes and does the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad stations. Um, this is the first piece we see of kind of international style modernism. Um, and the understanding of this building was they actually used the austerity at the time a bit in order to make the case for stripping all ornament from the building, right? We can't spend money on that stuff. So their stylistic goals were matched by the fact that they said their budget cuts would eliminate those sorts of uh, uh, features from the project. So you see no, really no ornamentation at all on this building, and it references a lot of the uh, uh, sort of uh, much more austere international style buildings that are happening at the time in other places in the country and are just starting to, to come to Iowa at that, at that period of time. Because uh, of course, a few years later, we have Saarinen, who was here um, with Thomas Church, um, designing the the uh, the Saren is designing the the Des Moines Art Center, um, and this building's been discussed a lot. You know, it's always sort of interesting the way it grabs the site. You know, it forms the the S shape that that grabs the forecourt on the front and the and the park on the back and transitions you through and has the large scale um, education wing so that it's about a community. This was one of the other buildings that the uh, uh, that the committee debated as being 
uh, one of the most significant buildings in Iowa. They all had cultural aspects to them, uh, and this one was one of the ones that was that was cited for that. And it really is an, an exquisite, an exquisite building over there. The way it stacks up out of the ground again with the stone. Oh. Um, oddly, this is a tough. This is a tough decade. Um, Oddly, Ingham and Fitch Hall were not selected by the, by the jury for this particular project, which surprised me. Maybe the photos weren't good. Maybe they had thought Drake had too many buildings, um, and they had to pick the best of them so that they wouldn't be overwhelmed with Drake buildings, which I guess I understand. Um, but, uh, and, and there's been some discussion about, about these projects, but um, uh, you know, sort of really super stripped down, very, very international style buildings. Um, Although there's this sort of, you know, there's the stack on the back here. There's the organic shaped uh, lecture hall over there. There's a sort of uh, acceptance of a certain international style modernism or, or more modern pieces because they have a kind of grounding with um, not being so super stripped down and foreign to the place that they sit. Um, and I don't know, and I, I, uh, Professor Papa Dimitri could probably speak to this better about what the relationship is on how modernism comes to the United States and is accepted when it has a more human quality to it in a way. Not as much of a, maybe a completely uh, uh, abstract international style quality, but has some grounding in organic form, <laughs> natural materials, maybe that's a finished um, uh, relationship to it. So, um, and you see that in these buildings still. As abstract as they are, there's these, these fantastic moments of kind of human scale and materials, so. Um, in the 50s, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who reinvents himself continuously through the, through the early part of the century, does some projects. But these are really projects that I think are, um, are, are, are not necessarily forward-looking as much as this is when he's famous and he's getting to do some houses for some people in Iowa. Cedar Rock's run by the DOT. It's a great project to go visit. It has the horizontal roofs that extend out. It's been, it's been put together very well. Uh, the interesting thing about this project is there's this little boathouse that sits on the back on the river, which is fantastic to go see. Because when you go see the boathouse, it's much more modern than the main house. Um, it's really kind of a cubic volume. It's more vertical. It has a bridge that runs out to it. It's, uh, the last time I saw it, it wasn't as restored as the rest of it. But you really get a sense of a more modern building aesthetic in that piece of the project where you are more free to experiment. Uh, in the overall, and then the Lamberson House in Oskaloosa as well, one of these very horizontal with a kitchen core that holds up the middle of it. Um, and uh, in the later part of the century, and kind of Ray Kreitz, who did C.Y. Stevens, does one of his own houses, uh, and he's got a whole series of incredible houses um, uh, around. This is, you know, obviously Craig Elwood inspired in some ways where it projects itself off of the side and is held with a steel frame and is wide open. It's got a lot of other references in it to Mies, uh, even to these kind of barrel vault uh, 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 you know, uh, pieces that are in it. Um, and uh, it's a pretty incredible uh, project. Uh, one of my former employers, Rod Cruzy, had worked for Ray Kreitz for a while. And he had always said that when Ray was doing a project and there was a structural problem, his basic opinion was, you know, if it looks like it'll work, it'll work. So just do it. You know, we don't. I don't. I don't care. Um, and uh, and you can see a lot of that, but uh, it seems to hold itself up. Um, again, Hubble Dining Hall. The other Drake projects. I think they had to pick from this decade in the project that they thought was the best. And and I've always been super impressed with this project. Um, the way that it sits there, the more planar volume of the top sitting on the base and projecting over is slightly different than the, the language of the dormitories. Uh, and the way it holds the site there, I've always found to be uh, in opposition to Meredith Hall across the way, whereas Meredith Hall is on a mound and sits up as a sort of object in that space. This one comes down through a depression and links itself into the courtyard that the dormitories sit in. So there's these two opposing buildings sitting across from one another. This one seems much more to to kind of defer to the space as primary as opposed to project itself as the, uh, as the, the, the main piece of that. And then the dormitories as well. I can't believe these didn't win. Uh, I was holding my breath when the jury went through these and didn't select them. Uh, uh, and uh, I agree, bring back the pool. A good friend of mine uh, was here in school at the time when the pool was there and said they were very popular. Um, both, you know, they ice skated on them as well as hung out in the summertime. So uh, it would be great to see. Here's the project that I, uh, uh, luckily got involved with, um, and uh, once David Croydonier, we determined that it would cost about $100,000 to put this building together. Um, David had uh, 
come across uh, with, with basically half of that money, $50,000, to be able to do the project. Um, and, uh, and so we started looking at how to deal with the integrity of the building so that it would stay for another 50 years. We didn't get to do everything we would have wanted to do. Um, you know, the stories of this building, at one time it was intended to be buried on the, on the uh, south side under the ground. Uh, you see this kind of uh, almost tilt-up panel-like vertical slot um, uh, rendering of it, and then the final rendering of it. What, I've, what I found remarkable about, uh, always found remarkable about this building is how how much you can compress that experience into such a small space, right? You can bring you in, change your axes, fully dark, move around the, the edge of the drum, and then all you see is the light upward. So it transitions your horizontal uh, understanding of, of, uh, to this vertical uh, experience when you go in there. Super compact, really emotional experience that happens in there. The thing you don't always notice when you're in, um, we had great, you know, great drawings of the project and the sort of simple pieces of of how it was made, but uh, here's a model that some st I had some students up at Iowa State put together, is the truss work that holds the, the roof up is kind of incredible, because actually what it does is there's the brick drum around the outside, but the truss work hangs the oculus in the middle in space, and so it's actually suspended there. And when you go in, you not only sort of feel the light coming through it, but you can also feel the hovering of that oculus. Um, and because this, and this truss work is not easy to understand, it, it flips back and forth into a series of kind of scissors that hold that truss, and, it's, uh, and the number of them as it comes around the outside um, is a little bit difficult to figure out even what's going on. These students built the floor of this out of plexiglass so you could put a mirror underneath it and see up through it so you could begin to understand the relationships of that. But the truss work is that structurally dynamic piece which you see in a lot of Aerosarinen's later work. And, and you can kind of see that, that interest in, it's a simple volume, but there's this moment where the, where the oculus is hung where the structure needed to be um, really expressive of that. Problems with the building uh, were that the skylight is a custom seven-sided, single-layer polycarbonate skylight that was up there. People thought, when I was approaching them, that it was uh, having condensation on the inside of it, and that was the reason why it was leaking. The problem was there were holes in it. Um, it was literally open in chunks where there were holes that had broken through it. It degraded under UV radiation. Um, you know, it was brittle, and it was literally leaking straight into the building, so all the woodwork underneath it was all damaged where the veneering had come off of that, and all of the exterior woodwork over time, you know, had, had gone into very bad shape. The problem with this was we knew we needed to redo the roof and the skylight, and we wanted to redo the woodwork. To redo the woodwork in here, you had to unbolt the trusses and hold them up with scaffolding. Uh, so it's terrifying enough to touch a building like this, you know, for fear that you would screw it up. But the notion that we had to unbolt the truss work to, in order to work on this uh, was really quite terrifying um, to, to even think about. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, I was always torn between constantly checking it and being afraid to come over uh, to look at it because <laughs> the worst case scenario. So, um, and you know, we kind of you delineate the pieces of the, of the project. That wooden truss work becomes a really important element of the pieces that go up and through it. Um, in the end, there was one torturous decision that I had to make uh, of this, which was, how do I replace the skylight? We had limited funds. We had to get as far as we could with them. There was no other money coming. Uh, and. Uh, were you going to redo a custom seven-sided polycarbonate skylight, which was going to cost a fortune to custom make, or were you going to come back in with what more conventionally would have worked as a sort of thermally broken aluminum and glass system on the top there? Ultimately, what it came down to was to get it done and get any further, we had to put a different shape of skylight top than was on there originally. I still have very mixed feelings about that. Um, beyond the fact that we matched the height of the original, um, and tried to make it as minimal as possible. The one good thing about it is it lets the light come through cleanly again, uh, which was not the case previously. The light was filtered. So you didn't get to see the quality of light in that space that it had originally uh, had lost to the previous skylight. Um, we also had to redo the coping and the edges of all of this. And uh, this was welded steel pieces which had rusted on the top. And how to do that, the coping alone would have cost $50,000 if we had to make it the way it was done originally. So there were a number of places where we really had to make moves to try to minimize the way the thing would come together uh, and try to maintain the integrity of it. Redoing the doors, 
unbelievably expensive to just refinish, pull the doors off and refinish them because we didn't want to put new doors on. We wanted to maintain the original doors. And so one of the things we noted when we were going through the staining on all of this is that, um, and this could be happenstance, but because of the weathering, is the, the color of the stain on the outside of the doors, the color of the stain on the inside of the doors, and the color of the stain on the curved wooden wall which faces you are progressively darker as you move through. And I thought this was probably just weathering that had happened on this door. Uh, but then I went and looked really carefully at the MIT Kresge Chapel, and I could be totally wrong about this, but the stain on the inside of it gets progressively darker as you move through from one edge to the other. So you get the sense that not only in light, but in the materials, he's trying to darken that, that experience as you move through it. Ultimately, this is what we came up with. The inside of that Oculus is, is beautiful now. The way the light comes through it is really clean. Uh, given more money, we would have redone all of the other woodwork and the entry to Medbury Hall. Um, but uh, in the end, uh, we tried to take care of the pieces that we could manage. I think what you note from this project a lot is this structurally dynamic roof uh, and the way that that truss work comes forward. Um, you see in a lot of Saarinen's later projects, right, really structurally dynamic projects, so that there's a, a link between what that project is and the effort to try to use the structurally dynamic pieces um, and many of the later projects that uh, have that same structurally dynamic quality that Saarinen's so well known for in the transition from Aliel to Arrow. So I think that's about where I am today. So. Thanks.